Hello and welcome to lecture 11 of type systems. So in this lecture we're going to uh, we're going to do two things. We're going to wrap up our study of continuations by looking at some of their applications and then we're going to start moving on to the final topic of this course. We're going to start looking at dependent type theory. Okay, so let's lo let's uh, let's look at continuations again. So what we've seen so far about continuations in the previous lectures is that classical logic has a beautiful type uh, inference system. So it's got a beautiful proof theory where proofs and refutations are precisely dual from each other, and all of the De Morgan dualities in uh, that you learned uh, in earlier logic classes have a corresponding uh, syntactic. Uh, proof or refutation equivalent inside their inference system. And we've also seen that classical logic, even though the proof theory doesn't intrinsically have an operational semantics, you can give it a computational reading by translating classical logic into constructive logic. And this is actually really quite a surprise because uh, Normally, we think of constructive or intuitionistic logic as a restriction of classical logic. So we say you have classical logic, and then you take away the double negation, the, princi uh, the principle of double negation elimination. But what we've seen here is that the other way around is true, too. We can think about uh, classical logic as a subsystem of constructive logic, and so that's what this double negation translation does. And once we have this uh, translation of classical logic into constructive logic, well, constructive logic is constructive, so we get an operational uh, interpretation for classical logic. So we can say, just as every uh, constructive proof corresponds to a functional program, so does every classical proof. Um, and so now, now that we have this, uh, this property that classical proofs can be read as having a uh, operational interpretation, you, the natural question is, what can we program with continuations? So remember, from the very beginning of the course, the, the pitch, the sales pitch of the course, is that types have a dual life, both as a logical concept and as a programming concept. And so we've seen the logical concept for uh, for negation and continuations. Now, how can we program with continuations? And so uh, programming with continuations is a lot easier if we use uh, the call CC or let CC primitive um, rather than using the uh, the proofs and refutation system because uh, the proofs and refutation systems makes the stack structure of programs explicit and you have to manage that stack explicitly which uh, I mean it's certainly doable but it's not like uh, an enormously uh, enormously enjoyable experience so it's better to use the type lambda calculus with continuations. And so the reason it's better is because for all the types that you're used to, like uh, products and sums and functions, it's exactly the same as in uh, constructive logic. We form pairs with, uh, with pairing, we uh, get components by projecting from a uh, from a pair or a pair when we want to program with sums we add tags with left of e and right of e and then when we want to use something of some type we can do a case analysis and say case analyze e and then take the left branch or the right branch and similarly for functions we can do a lambda abstraction to create a function and we can use an application to use a function and we saw in the last lecture that we can similarly give two constructs to program with continuations by introducing a throw and a let cont operator. And so let cont binds the, uh, the current continuation to a variable and then evaluates the body and throw when it will take a continuation of type not x and an x and send that x to the continuation. Okay, and so you know you can see the typing right here. So we have let cont u um, dot e has the type x when e is an expression of type x, assuming that uh, 
u is a variable of type not x. And so again, if you think about this in terms of logic, if you this is like sort of proof by contradiction. In order to prove x, we assume not x, and if that not x ever leads to a contradiction, then we're done. Um, like by, by x falso, we get our answer. And you can see that reasoning principle right here. So we, if we have a not x, and we ever find an x, we can throw e prime to the a continuation e, and then we get a y, which is some arbitrary type. And operationally, what's happening is that um, when we throw e prime to e, we're doing a jump. And so this expression throw is never going to return, so we can give it any type we like. And so the let cont operation is sort of taking your program stack and capturing it. And we saw that with the continuation machine, where we had a, a value and a continuation, and whenever we did a reduction, we would push something onto the continuation stack. Um, that's, what, that's still what's going on here, but it's totally implicit. Okay, so if we want to program with continuations, uh, we need a programming language which supports them. And uh, in the standard ML programming language, which looks rather a lot like OCaml, if you know that better, um, the, it has support for continuation. So it's got a module cont, and it has uh, a one type and two operations. The type is a type constructor cont, so uh, so like a uh, int cont is a continuation that's expecting an integer, a string cont will be one that's expecting a string, and so on. And we've got two operations, call cc um, and throw. And we can see how throw looks a lot like the throw primitive from the, from the previous slide. We have something of type alpha cont and uh, uh, argument of type alpha, and then we get out any beta we like. But the type of call cc looks a little bit funnier. It has a function type in it. So how does that work? And well, alpha cont is not a, as in type theory. Throw, throw kv in SML is like throw kv in type theory. And the one thing that's a little bit different is call cc. So when we write call cc fn x arrow e, that's exactly like writing let cont x dot e in, in our type theory that we've developed. So we're using this function fn x arrow e to simulate this binding expression. So let cont binds x inside the body of e, and we give it a function in order to get an expression that has a, that has a free variable in it. And so this way we can simulate uh, we can simulate the uh, um, we can simulate the uh, use of of uh, a binding operator in a programming language, which doesn't let you like extend your language of binding operators. Okay, so as an uh, as a warm up example for. Uh, for programming with continuations, let's take a look at this one here. So we've got the this mull program, and all it does is it takes a list of integers and it produces a new integer. And the way that it does this, as its name might suggest, is simply by multiplying all of the elements of the list. So if we have an empty list, we're going to return one, and if we have a cons, n cons down to n's, then we'll multiply n by multiplying all the elements of the tail. And so this is the kind of this is the kind of thing you would write in like your your first week of 1a and so all it's doing is multiplying a list of integers and one interesting property of the bull function which comes from the uh, from the structure of of, of multiplication in arithmetic is that if a zero occurs anywhere in the list the whole result is zero and this is actually quite inefficient well a little bit inefficient because um, because even if you have a list of a thousand numbers, if you see a zero at the very first element, you're still going to do that thousand, those thousand multiplications. And so you might think, okay, well, we can make this program a little bit less inefficient. Maybe what we can do is we can add a case to detect whether or not, uh, whether or not, uh, um, zero occurs in that list, and if it does, we'll do an early exit. 
So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, well, I see a, if I see a unit, I'll return one as before. And if I see zero at the front of the list, I'll immediately return zero. I'm not going to bother trying to multiply together, multiplying together the rest of the list. It's just going to be ignored because we know that that multiplication doesn't matter. And otherwise, if the head is not zero, then we'll carry on doing the multiplication as before. And so we're still multiplying a list of integers. And now if zero occurs in the list, we're going to immediately return zero. And so our mul prime function will immediately return if we call it on the number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And so that way we've saved ourselves nine multiplications. But there's one issue with this function, and namely, if we put zero at the end, if we wrote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, and we called it, this function is still going to end up doing a bunch of multiplications because we, we're going to recurse down to the last element of the list. We're going to see it's a zero, and then we're going to multiply by zero nine times. We'll multiply nine by zero to get zero. We'll multiply eight by zero to get zero. We'll multiply seven by zero to get zero, and all the way back down to one times zero in order to get zero. And so, yeah, that's not so much fun. Okay, well, is there a, so you might ask, is there a way to not do this work. So in the case specific case of multiplication and small lists, it's not really a big deal. So, you know, a multiplication, your computer can do billions of them a second. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not the end of the world if you do nine multiplications rather than zero. But, you know, can imagine that this multiplication could stand in for some much more expensive operation. Um, so maybe rather than multiplication, it's going to be matrix multiplication of some large, uh, you know, 5,000 by 5,000 matrix. So in that case, it would be a lot more interesting in order to, uh, in order to have this kind of early exit available. So is there any way that we can write a program which will, which will, when it detects the zero, it will immediately return the uh, return the zero without uh, without doing all of the intermediate multiplications. And because we're talking about applications of continuations, you're going to guess the answer is yes, and you're also going to guess that we can do it with continuations. And so here's how we can do it. So what we can do is we can. Uh, we can use a what are called escape continuations. So our looping function, what it's going to do is it's going to receive a continuation, which is the place to jump to, along with the list of integers and and uh, that as its as its argument. So we'll we'll call this uh, we'll call this uh, continuation. We'll call it return. And what we'll do is we'll say if we see an empty list, we we. Uh, we simply return. We're not invoking return. We're just going to uh, we're just going to return one, and when we have a a number, what we're going to do is we'll multiply n times the result of calling loop uh, a return ends. And it's only in the case where we see a zero that we'll do anything interesting. So the the point is that we have this return continuation, and we're going to call throw. Uh, return zero. And so what we're doing is we're going to send zero to this return continuation. And we're going to ignore our existing continuation and we'll save ourselves some work. Um, so how do we get a hold of that return continuation? Well, we have this mull fast function. And what we want to do is right at this point right here where my mouse cursor is pointing, we want to return the answer. And so we can say call cc, capture the stack right up to this point right here, and then we'll name that ret and we'll call loop on ret ends. And so now if we ever see this return zero, we will jump back to this point right before we started the multiplication and with our zero and we'll inter abort all of the pending n times whatever re loop returns that we've pushed on the stack. So think about this in terms of stack manipulations. So what we're doing in this recursive case is we're saying, okay, call loop recursively on n's and when it returns, we'll multiply by n. Um, and so what's going to happen is that we're going to uh, we're going to build up a long series of 
of tiny little tack, uh, stack frames. So on loop 987654321, we'll have, okay, we'll have nine times waiting for loop to return, and then, then we'll have eight times waiting for loop of eight, uh, loop of that tail to return and so we'll end up at the very last case with however many whatever the length of the list is in stack frames and what this throw will do is it will jump over all of those stack frames and discard them in order to return zero just right here so now what loop is going to do is it's just going to multiply its arguments on the zeros and when it sees zero it's going to throw to its continuation and because molfast has captured that continuation and passed it to loop, we'll be able to skip over all of the uh, all of the arguments. Um, so now let me see if maybe I can uh, I can draw an example here of how this program is working. So here, so we've got our function loop, and what it's going to do is it say I'm going to return one on the empty list if I've got uh, zero. Oh yes, we need our return continuation. And we will throw return zero and otherwise what we're going to do is we're going to simply carry on with the multiplication. n times uh, and so if you call uh, loop on a with some continuation k and we have our we have our function one two three four let's put a let's see let's leave out the zero case to start fit start with the way that this will evaluate is it's going to on the first step step uh, pattern match on that list and it's going to call loop k uh, um, two three four and this thing is going to evaluate to one times, two times, loop k, three, four. And then this will step to one times, two times, three times, loop k, four. And now this will step to one times and you can see that this program is going to build up these pending multiplications because our operational semantics says that when you do a multiplication the arguments to a function have to be values and so to multiplication takes two arguments and this is certainly a value but when we but loop is not so we have to wait for the function call to return before um, before we uh, before we can do the multiplication and operationally we implement that by pushing this uh, this multiplication onto the stack and then evaluating loop and so finally what's going to happen is this thing is going to become a one and now we can finally start to do these multiplications so now that we have these we can uh, we can we can perform the multiplications that we want and now we are going to end with a multiplication of 24. Okay, and so now the question is, how does how does this function work with our mol fast? And so function mol fast said, well, if you give me some list of ends, I want you to call the current continuation with a, a function, uh, name it k, and then we'll loop with this k, or we called it ret on the slides. And so what would mulfast to do? Well, let us change this by stick it, changing this uh, 
this, this expression. And so what we're going to do here is if we call, so it's, if somewhere in the program we call mul fast of ends, what we're going to do is what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, what I want to do is this is going to step to call CC and it's going to become loop of, and now here's what the continuation, uh, how the continuation gets represented. We're capturing the rest of the program, the stuff on the stack, we're naming it loop, and now what we're going to do is we're going to call it with ends. And so now let me put a zero in here so you can see what it looks like. Let's, uh, so that we can be as concrete as possible with this program. And there. And so now let me Yeah, let me let me do a search and replace here so you can see what the uh, what the uh, what the reduction will look like. Okay, and now let's change that four to a zero. Okay. Okay, and so now what's going to happen is we're going to start as usual. So we have one, two, three, zero with zero at the very last bit. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to recur as we did before. Um, and so this loop expression will build up its multiplication and then what it's going to do is it's going to say when you reach when you reach the uh, when you reach zero so right here we're going to throw throw x to uh, to e what your pro what our program is going to do sorry I want to make one small adjustment to this I left something out what we're going to do is we're going to throw zero to x and we're going to discard this continuation here. So what this program will step to is just zero. So our whole program will sort of step after some number of these loop reductions to e of zero and we never do these multiplications in the middle. So what we're doing is we take we capture that that surrounding context, the stack, and we name it. We name it. Uh, we name it. We name that k, or the continuation argument. And then when we evaluate this thing, what we're going to do is we're going to throw zero to that continuation. And so we're going to eventually evaluate to e of zero. Sorry, I keep I keep putting in an extra thing here. And so we've saved the continuation, e of x, and now we're going to throw 0 directly to that continuation, and we're never going to, uh, we're never going to actually run the, uh, run the, do the intervening multiplications. Okay, so this should give you some idea of, okay, I'm remembering where the, where on the stack the continuation was, and whenever, uh, whenever I, uh, whenever I uh, uh, throw to a continuation, I go directly to that stack point, skipping everything in the middle. And this is the other thing that makes implementing continuations a bit expensive. And because continuations themselves are just values, sometimes to implement a conti first class continuations, you're going to have to copy your stack and have multiple copies of it. And that's what we're going to see in the very next example here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a primitive called AMB. So this was introduced in 1961 by John McCarthy, the inventor of Lisp. And what he did was he said, okay, well, we've been developing programming languages for the past decade or so. Um, and so he said, well, we're still thinking about how we should write uh, programs. Maybe we should experiment with more language constructions. And I'm going to talk about this one called AMB. And what it does is it's an operator for angelic non-determinism. And so what he said was, 
we're going to have an operator amb and it's going to non-deterministically uh, select one of the arguments that it has. So amb can get, say, a, a whole list of arguments, in this case, one, two, three, and then a second call four, five, six. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that um, the value that X and Y actually get are whatever is needed in order to make the con computation succeed. So what does that mean? Let's look down here. We have this assert statement. And so this we are putting in an assert that say X times Y has to equal 10. And then we'll return the pair X comma Y. And if you look here, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the only pair of those numbers that actually whose product is, uh, is, uh, is 10 is the pair 2, 5. So if x is 2 and y were 5, then that's what x and y should be. And his idea was that this would be useful for sort of AI programming, where you have like many choices to make, but you're not sure which one to make. You can say amb of the possibilities and the uh, language runtime will say, okay, well, whenever I see a uh, assertion, I'm going to refine the set of possibilities that X and Y could possibly be. Um, or I'm going to backtrack to where I set the variables and give them a new assignment. And so, you know, there's, uh, there's three times three, nine, nine possible executions here. And this assert here is going to filter out, uh, filter out many of them, leaving, uh, leaving us only with the single result two comma five. And so um, it's, it's not like randomization in that you're not choosing something at random and then you're stuck with that choice. The way that AMB works is you give it the selection of, of possibilities and you tell the, you tell the computer, okay, I want you to have, make the program look as if you picked the solution that makes the cal computation work. So it, this is what makes it angelic rather than uh, than demonic non-determinism. De demonic non-determinism means that the compile that the la language is trying to pick what will make what will make your computation fail. Angelic non-determinism is trying to m choose what will make your computation succeed. And randomness is when you just pick something at random. You've made a non-deterministic choice, but there's no uh, there's no uh, sort of forward looking into the future with random with random choice. But with angelic non-determinism, you do look into the future and you're trying to make sure that your computation succeeds. So you can think it's angelic because the non-determinism is, is helping you. It's making more of your programs succeed. And the way that we implement this is actually by doing a search. Because, you know, at the point that you do, uh, assign X or Y, you don't actually know what's going to, what's going to make the search, uh, the, which assignment is going to succeed. And so the way that AMB is usually implemented is by backtracking. So we'll, we'll do a trial assignment of X and Y. And if the, uh, if the assignment succeeds, that's great. And if it fails, we'll, back, we'll backtrack to the point where we did the assignment and we'll make a new assignment. Um, and so this backtracking can be implemented using continuations. Okay, so how can we implement backtracking using continuations? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to see a mouthful of a type. And so what we want to do is we want to have our external API is going to be very simple. We'll have an exception amb fail for computations that just entirely failed. And we're going to have an assertion uh, form, which is a... Uh, um, just a Boolean test. It says if this Boolean is true, then carry on evaluating, and if it's false, then backtrack and make a new uh, make a pick a new assignment of variables. And we'll also have an operation amb, which says if you give me a list of integers, that I'm going to choose one sort of non-deterministically. Um, and the way that we're going to implement it is using two operations: fail and stack. And um, the stack is our list of backtracking points. And in this, uh, in this API, we're choosing our non-deterministic values to be a non-deterministic set of integers. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a reference, which is going to be our mutable stack. And this reference is going to contain a list of backtrack points. And what's a backtrack point? Well, it's a place in the code that you can jump to, which is a continuation, and these these uh, continuations are non-deterministic computations, which can either produce an integer or they can fail. 
And so that's how we get this monster type int option cont list ref. Um, and then we'll have a fail, which is just the signal to say that this computation has actually indeed failed. Okay, and so how do we implement this? Well, we're going to declare an exception type uh, amb fail, which is the failure exception for unsatisfiable computations. And then what our initial stack is going to be is just going to be an empty stack. So this is our stack of our backtrack points, which I talked about on the last slide. And the way that fail works is we're going to say the current continuation is failed, try something else. And what it will do, what fail will do, is it will look at our stack and say, well, if the stack of backtrack points is empty, then we raise the amp fail exception. But if we've got another possibility to try, if our stack of backtrack points is non-empty, we're going to pop a, uh, a backtrack point off of that stack. So k gets popped off the stack, the stack gets upstated to k's, so there's no, uh, k is no longer on the stack, and then we're going to jump to, we're going to jump to k. And we're going to tell k, okay, I'm going to give you none because you need to start, uh, start executing now. And then what our assertion operation will do is it's going to say if the, if the assertion condition is true, then we just return a unit and otherwise we fail. Um, and it looks like I have a LaTeX error on this slide. Okay, and so all assert will doing is it's going to say if my assert condition is true, then skip. Otherwise, we're going to uh, we're going to invoke the fail primitive. So remember that stack this this stack and this fail operation are not actually manipulated by client code. Okay, and so now the heart of the AMB function is, uh, the heart of the AMB implementation is in the implementation of the AMB primitive itself. And so AMB receives a list of integers, and what it's going to do is it's going to uh, backtrack immediately if it sees an empty list. Because in this case, the list is empty, and so there is uh, uh, no, more, no more possible assignments to this, uh, to this variable. Um, however, if we have several possibilities, if we have amb x x's, then we need to do a computation. And so in order to do this computation, we're going to define an auxiliary function called next. And next will take a value, an integer, and a continuation. And what it's going to do is it's going to push k onto that stack, and then it's going to carry on with some y. And it's going to say, uh, this is the value that I'm like sort of computing with. And what our call CC is going to do is um, we're going, we want to, we want here to select between X and X's. And we want to do this by first returning X's if we can. But we need to remember that we could have chosen to evaluate, uh, choose one of the elements in X's. And we're going to do that by using call CC. And so what call CC will do is it's going to say grab the current continuation and then we'll pass it to next. And so what next is going to do is it's going to stick the current continuation. And remember what we've got is this recursive call which is going to look at x's next and we're going to stash that onto the stack of continuations and then we're going to return with the v. So if we if we actually got a uh, if we actually got a value, we're going to uh, we're going to return with v. And if we came here via a backtrack point, what we're going to do is we will uh, resume by making the recursive call ambexes. And you can see that uh, the way this works is if we call uh, next x on our first trip through, what we're going to do is we're going to return some. Uh, x in this case of a, a number and when we come to uh, when we come to a failure we throw we throw with a with a none and so if if uh, we know that we're returning here via via a backtracking uh, Via, via a backtrack, we'll get the none and if we're on this on the first success path we're going to get our sum and so now if we're here on the on the first iteration, we're going to return that first element of the list. So if we call 
uh, next on uh, on x, it will return sum of x, and then we'll immediately return x, having saved the continuation. But if our continuation is if that saved continuation is invoked with a none, then we'll say, okay, we know that the assignment to x failed, and what we're going to do is we're going to call amb on the tail, and so we're going to try the other values if we're if we came to the backtrack point. And so you know, here's a here's a, a little example. So uh, perhaps some of you will have played Dungeons and Dragons, and in Dungeons and Dragons, you're, you you play you play ideally a mighty hero who's trying to save the world, and you choose their characteristics like strength or intelligence or uh, or charisma or whatnot by rolling three six-sided dice and adding up the result. And uh, because you're playing a, uh, a mighty hero, you're going to want to have some condition to ensure that you don't roll a three. And so you might have a rule like, okay, we want, uh, we want our uh, barbarian strength to be greater than 13, and we don't want to allow any, any case where, the, uh, uh, where any of the dice came up a one. Okay. So what will come up when you do that? Well, you can model this by saying, okay, I want x, y, and z to be drawn from 1 through 6, and then I'll put in all of those conditions here. I'm going to assert that the sum is bigger than, or, uh, is bigger than 13, and I'm going to assert that each of x, y, and z are larger than 1. And then this is going to enumerate some of the possible, uh, possible throws of these three dice for me. Um, and so let's, let's take a look at this. is so here's our here's our implementation here um, so this is in the standard ml of new jersey implementation we've got our stack we've got our fail and here's the one thing i sort of want to draw out in uh, in the uh, slide for space reasons i just wrote this as uh, um, i just wrote this uh, this um, amb operation as uh, um, as taking taking that x and uh, I I just uh, I uh, I just eat it I did just eat it an eta expansion here um, rather than uh, leaving it uh, leaving it in a point free style okay but that's not so important okay okay and so we've implemented amb and you can see here that the uh, uh, the, the type of stack is just as we saw on the slide. It's a uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, we have uh, we have a fail which takes a unit. We have assert which takes a boolean, and we have amb which takes a, a list of values and returns a uh, uh, returns one of those values. Okay, and so now we can actually see these examples. So we can run. Test one, and what shall we see? Ah, we got three five as before, and when we run test two, it's going to select one of these options where uh, x plus y plus z is greater than or equal to 13. And now let's see what happens if we say that x has to be bigger than four. And so now what it did is it selected one for us it said, okay, well, x is, has to be bigger than four, so it'll be five, and y will be two, and uh, z will be six. And so now in this, in this case, uh, those would be our three throws of the dice. Um, right. So that is how, uh, how AMB works as a, as a, as a program. And, um, the important thing is that AMB, in order to implement it, the interesting thing about it is it required the combination of both state and continuations. Our escape, we could just capture a continuation and then jump to it immediately. But in order to do backtracking, we needed to remember what the old continuations were. And in order to do that, what we needed to do was we needed we needed some state. We needed to, uh, to uh, have a reference cell where we can store our old continuations. and 
There's a theorem by Andrei Falinsky, who proved this about 25 years ago, that the combination of state and continuations is a universal effect. And what this means is that what he called any definable monadic effect, the details of which I'm not going to go into, can be expressed as a combination of state and first-class control, so first-class continuations. So exceptions can be described this way, green threads, coroutines and generators, random number generation, any of these kinds of uh, uh, computational effects can be expressed if you've got both state and control. And so this, this means that continuations and, uh, are an extremely powerful uh, uh, primitive for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for manipulating the control flow of your program. And uh, uh, they, together with state, they let you express almost, uh, almost any, uh, any effect you can think of for your program. Um, and obviously non-determinism, as we saw. So this is a uh, this is a incredibly powerful uh, powerful set of primitives, and you might ask, okay, well, how come every language doesn't have uh, state and first class continuations? Like, how come a language like Haskell portrays itself as an advance over earlier functional languages like ML and Scheme by removing state from the ambient language? And this is this is actually a really good language design question. So the trouble with having powerful effects is that the more powerful the effects your language supports, the less clients can reason about the functions that they're invoking. So um, when you uh, when you call an unknown function in Haskell, you know perfectly well what it's going to do. It's either going to give you a value or it's going to go into an infinite loop. Whereas in uh, standard ML or OCaml or Java, if you call a function, you don't know what it's going to do. If you call a function, it can you know return a value or go into an infinite loop, just like in Haskell. But it can also uh, it can also send messages over the no network. It can launch the nuclear missiles. It can. Uh, um, it can delete your file system. You had you just have no idea. So this makes reasoning about programs more difficult. And so you have this trade-off where um, where life gets easier for you if you have a powerful effect in your hand, and but it gets harder for your clients. Uh, and since every program is uh, written as modules, part of your program will be uh, clients for another part. The uh, the the trade-off between power and of expressiveness uh, expressiveness and ease of reasoning is actually a pretty subtle one. Okay, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to dependent types, and so the way that dependent types work is they are going to be like sort of uh, the most sophisticated instance of the Curry-Howard correspondence that we're going to see in this class. So what we've seen so far is that intuitionistic propositional logic corresponds to the simply typed lambda calculus. Classical propositional logic corresponds to the simply typed lambda calculus plus first class continuations. And pure second order logic corresponds to the polymorphic lambda calculus or system F. So that's that's very nice, but there's something missing here. So each of these logical systems has a corresponding computational system, but we're missing something from ordinary everyday mathematics. Mathematics, like like the kind you do in all your other courses, uses quantification over individual elements. So we might have a theorem which is too difficult to set for homework of the form for all x, y, and z and n if they're natural numbers. Then, if n is bigger than 2, then x to the n plus y to the n is not equal to uh, z to the n for any n. So this is Fermat's last theorem. It's uh, a powerful theorem. It's, a, it's like one of the highest achievements in mathematics, and it cannot be expressed in any of the uh, type theories that we've seen so far, at least not, not via this Curry-Howard correspondence of treating, uh, cre treating propositions as types. And so the reason is that this proposition uses quantification. We quantify over individual numbers here, x, y, z, and n. We're saying these are specific natural numbers. They're not the type nat. That's what shows up here. They're just numbers, 3, 4, 17. Um, and the formula over here, this conditional, if n is greater than 2, then x to the n plus y to the n is not equal to z to the n, that is a formula that refers to these individual elements. And so the, the 
types that we've seen so far largely can't do this. So, so this in the simply typed lambda calculus, we can talk about nat, but we can't talk about you know five or x in the type system. And in the uh, second order lambda calculus, we can talk about a type variable alpha and quantify over it, and that sort of represents an entire set of natural numbers, but not a specific natural number. And so this brings us back to logical curiosity that we saw so many lectures before. So we introduced this type nat, and we said zero is a natural number, and successor takes a natural number and gives you a new natural number, and then if you have a natural number e naught, you can iterate over it with the iter construct. So if it's, we can say if e naught is zero, return x, and if it's successor of something, recursively iterate on the, on the predecessor, and then use e2 bind that to x and then use e2 to calculate the value on the successor. So we're recursing over the natural number. And so, okay, so computationally this is perfectly sensible, um, but logically it's equivalent to the unit type. We have, a, we have an implication, unit implies n, and nat implies unit. So why, what, what logical rule does this natural number type have if it's, if it's, uh, um, if it's logically equivalent to unit. And so the the problem here is that our language of types had no way of distinguishing zero from successor of zero. These two just looked the same. And the thing, the idea behind dependent types is, well, let's, uh, let's fix this problem. We couldn't dis distinguish zero from one, so we'll fix that. We'll now let types refer to values. So the type grammar and the term grammar are now going to be mutually recursive. So far, when we've been defining a language, we define a grammar of types, and then we could define a grammar of terms, and then we define some typing judgments that refer to the two of them. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we're going to let the types contain terms in them, so that you know zero and successor of zero can ap appear in types, and um, this is going to uh, this is going to offer a huge gain in expressive power now that types and terms can refer to each other um, so we'll have a much much more powerful programming language um, and rather than giving you a whole bunch of typing rules to start with I'm going to show you how this works by means of a dependently typed programming language called Agda so much of the earlier course we leaned on ML as a way of getting intuition for the type theory and uh, before we look at the de theory of dependent types in the final lecture, we're going to look at the implementation Agda, so you can see what it looks like. And so Agda is a dependently typed functional programming language. You can go to the Agda homepage and download it yourself. Um, and I've put a link on the slide so that you can you can see it. Um, and so, like sort of basic Agda actually looks quite a lot like uh, like Haskell does. So we have data type declarations in in Agda where we say um, we're declaring the data type boolean, which is a set. So set is what what Agda calls types, um, and true and false are going to be constructors of the boolean type. And once you have this data type declaration, you can define functions like not. So we can define this by, by uh, clauses or pattern matching. So not true is equal to false, not false is equal to true. And so far, this looks exactly like a clausal definition in Haskell or uh, SML might look. And then we can also define inductive data types. So, so we can define the natural numbers. We can say, uh, zero is a natural number and successor is a data type constructor which takes a natural number and gives you back a new natural number and so this will let you define functions like addition and multiplication and um, these functions that we define can be recursive but they'll get checked for termination and one interesting thing about agda is that um, it doesn't just let you define uh, functions, it lets you define them as mix fix single, symbol, infix symbols. So here we're defining a function which takes two arguments, we're going to call it plus. And we're writing underscores to say that the arguments will go to the left and the right of the plus. So zero plus m is going to equal m, successor of n plus m is going to be successor of n plus m. And once we've defined addition, we can do the same thing for multiplication. So zero times m is going to be equal to zero. And if we have successor of n times m, that's going to be m plus n times n. And 
Um, this ability to define like uh, mix fix operators in Agda is uh, extremely convenient, but it, you know it's a it's an easily misused feature. Uh, so it can be used to make programs much more readable, and it can also be used to make them much less readable. And this is a recursive definition, but Agda will check it for termination. So just as Godel's system T, every definition terminates, Agda also has a termination checker to ensure that every, uh, every function that you write in Agda pat, uh, terminates. Um, and so let me actually uh, uh, see if I can do that here. Mal.agda. Data net. So we have our we have our definition of the natural numbers, and now let's define the uh, the addition operation. And so we'll say zero plus m is equal to m, and we'll say successor of n plus m is going to equal successor of n plus m. And so if we evaluate it, we can do something like successor of 0 plus successor of 0, and oh, that's a uh, Okay, so so that gave us the type. Uh, so now we can evaluate an Agda expression, and it'll say, okay, one plus one is two. Okay, so that's fine. But let's see what happens if we try to break our termination here. So what if we made this recursive call call itself uh, so that it'll go into an infinite loop? So now successor of n plus m is equal to successor of n plus m. So that is a you know type well typed, but it's not going to terminate. And it's going to say termination checking failed for the following reasons in plus. The problematic call is successor of n plus m. And it's going to say this addition is problematic because I can't tell that this program terminate that this, this uh, recursion will terminate, and so Agda will do this kind of structural termination checking to ensure that every function you write will will in fact terminate. And Agda also supports polymorphic data types like ML and uh, Haskell do, so we can define a type of lists um, where we say we have a list of A where the element type is a set. And that's also a set type, and the empty list an ill is a list, and the cons operation takes a a and a list of a's and gives you a new list of a's. And what we can do now is uh, we can define a function like append. And so what append is going to do here is we're going to say give me the type argument a, um, the first list and the second list, and I'll give you a new list. So if you append uh, the empty list to y's, you get y's. If you append uh, um, x const onto x's and y's, you'll cons x onto appending x's and y's. And I wrote this function in two ways here. I've got app and I've got app prime. And the difference is uh, that app prime has its type argument here in curly braces. And so what it's doing is it's saying, okay, we have a polymorphic data type and we would really like the compiler to infer this argument. So app right here has an explicit system F style polymorphism. So you can read this as the ML, SML, as the system F type for all a dot list a to list a to list a. And over here, we want to say, well, I want this for all to be inferred. And so the applications, like app prime here, don't have to explicitly mention the type. Try to infer it. OK. And so now we get to the bit of Agda, which is where um, its, its genuinely new features live. So this type here is a, a, the type of what are conventionally called vectors, their length indexed list. So we're going to say we have a vector of element type A, and it's also going to get a second parameter, which is the type of natural numbers. 
So we're now what we're going to do is we're going to say that the empty list is a vector of length zero and cons is going to uh, take an element a, a head a, and a vector, a tail of length n, and it's going to give you a list uh, of length successor of n. So if you take a so if you think about this, this makes sense. If you have a length of list five and you con something onto it, you're going to get a list of length six. And we're going to also say here that cons wants the natural number argument to be implicit. And so we've got our length indexed list here. So cons is going to take the head and a list of length n and produce a list of length n plus one. And the empty list has a length of zero. So what we've got here is um, a list type that tracks in its, uh, in its type the length of the, of the list. And uh, that length is going to be a program term in Agda. Um, so it can be a literal number like three or four or zero, but it can also be like, you know, additions and multiplications and things like this. Um, and so once you have length index data types, this gives you a lot of ability to write programs that would have been unsafe in languages like OCaml, they'll, they'll become safe in, in Agda. So the simplest example is the head function on lists. So the head function on lists just gives you the first element. And so if you might give it in uh, OCaml, the length, the type list of A to A. And what it'll do is if it's a, uh, uh, a cons you give the first element and if it's the t if it's the empty list you throw an exception in acta however you can say i want the type of head to be something that is a vector of length successor of n so this is a length which is non zero and if we know that the length is non zero we're only going to need one pattern match clause we're going to say that the head of x constant onto x's is x and that's the whole program um, that's the entire set of programs we uh, patterns we need. We don't need to handle the empty case because the empty case is impossible. So we have no nil pattern at all. And so the Agda coverage checker is going to say this this uh, this uh, pattern was not needed for coverage checking. So let me actually show you that data. So again, what we're doing is we're defining the cons constructor here, which takes an A and a, a tail of length N, and it's going to give you a, a, a list of length one more than that. And so now what we can do is we can write the head function, which takes a, a list and its uh, a element type and its, uh, its length, and it's going to give you it's going to take that list and it's going to give you an it. And so what we can see here is we have x const onto x's and we can, uh, we can just return x. So now let's see what happens if we change the type of this to just n. And now Agda is going to complain we have an incomplete pattern match for head. We're missing the case that for when it's uh, when it's of length zero. But if we made the 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 list successor of n, then it passes coverage checking. So the coverage checker will use the types to decide whether certain patterns are needed or not. And um, this lets us write functions like head, which only have a, a partial set of the patterns for the uh, for the vector type, and it's okay because the coverage checker will warn us if we miss any. Okay, and so now the the I mentioned earlier that this natural number index uh, doesn't have to be a constructor or variable; it can be an arbitrary ag, uh, agda term. So, for instance, here's the append function. And what it's doing is it's saying, I want a vector of length n, 
and I want a vector of length m, and if you append the two, what do you get? So if you have a list of length n and a list of length m, you can uh, append the two of them together to get a list of length n plus m. And that works great. So we can write append nil y's and we get y's, append cons x comma x's onto y's, and then we cons x onto appending x's and y's. And Agda is perfectly happy to accept this definition, and we've learned something very precise about the type. We've learned that this append function um, takes a list of length n and a list of length m and gives you a list of length uh, n plus m. And so that's quite a uh, quite a, a really powerful property. So we're able to use arbitrary functions of the type. So n plus m is a, just a regular Agda program term. And so now we've we have this very powerful guarantee that uh, appending two vectors gives us a vector whose length is the sum of the two. And this means that we can do things like uh, you know if we have several lists, uh, you know n, m, and successor of y, we can append all of them together, and then we'll be able to deduce um, that the uh, that we can take the head of that safely, because we know that at least one of the lengths lists that we're appending together has a non-zero length. Um, but there's a slight fly in the uh, I, our, our ointment here. So here, what we've done, ah, yeah, so not sorry. This isn't this isn't the fly in the ointment. We'll get to the fly in the ointment in a bit. And so this this ability to do uh, to get get a lot of type checking mileage means that if we make errors like forgetting to uh, to do a cons, we'll get a type error from Agda. So let's actually see that. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the app function, and it's going to take a inferred uh, type argument, and it's going to take two natural number arg uh, arguments, which we also want to be inferred, and it's going to take two vectors. And we want to return something of the type vector a n plus m. And so we'll say, let's, uh, let's try to do our case split here, and if the, the first argument is empty, well, we can return y's, and otherwise we can cons x onto appending x's and y's. Okay, so that's great. And now, what will happen if we forgot to if we forgot to con something? Aha! And so we get a type error. So we say that uh, expression n plus m23, that's an inferred variable, is not equal to successor of n plus m. So we inferred that we had something of type n plus m, and we need something of type successor of n plus m. Um, and so we have this mismatch between the uh, inferred and the uh, uh, expected types. So the, so the type of append actually failed. And so let me, let me see if I can provoke it into giving slightly better error messages. So this curly braces in the uh, application list, it means we're telling Agda, that I want the uh, I want to make this implicit argument explicit, and so now this this type checked, and now if we yeah, so now what we're what we see here is okay. It's not it's not so different. We're getting uh, we're getting so we want something of type successor of n one plus m, and we're getting something of types n one plus m. And it's not it's not quite the right it's not quite the right uh, white right type, and you can see here that now um, one of the difficulties of programming with dependent types comes up. So we did get a type error when we uh, when we forgot to con something on, but the type error can be like uh, quite inscrutable, fr frankly, because the in order to make the program readable, we have to do lots of inference, and when you do lots of inference, that makes the uh, that makes the inferred constraints uh, uh, sort of difficult to decipher because there's a lot of stuff that the compiler had to infer, and how does it present that inferred information to the user? That's still sort of a, uh, a HCI question of dependent types. That's uh, that's still under a lot of study. 
Okay, so but the but the high level point here is that the static type checking ensured a runtime guarantee. So we were able to guarantee at runtime that when we call append, the result will be a result of the length that's of the length of the uh, sum of the lengths of the two arguments, and type checking guaranteed that this runtime guarantee will hold. Um, so one thing, and this is actually like the central thing that makes mechanizing mathematics independent type theory possible, is what's called the identity type, or how you represent equality in AGDA. Um, and so we can introduce a data type, and we're going to say, okay, a data type uh, that's indexed by an element A, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to take two arguments, and it's going, to, we're going to say ruffle has the type A is equal to itself. And so A equals B is going to be the type of proofs that A and B are equal, and the constructor REFL says that a term is equal to itself. And so the equalities arising from evaluation are automatic, so AGDA will automatically propagate all the equalities that arise from program reduction, so 3 plus 4 and 7 are, are going to be automatically the same, but many other equalities, like the proof that addition is commutative, that n plus m is equal to m plus n, even if they're variables, that has to be proved with a proof in AGDA. And we'll see in the next lecture how we can do that. Actually, no, we can, we can take a quick look at it right here. Um, so some of the theorems in AGDA are automatic. So here we have, we've defined addition, and if we wanted to prove that 0 plus n is equal to n, well, that's automatic because we have this evaluation equation that says if you see 0 plus m, it evaluates to m. And so we can appeal to reflexivity. We can say these two th terms evaluate to the same term, so by reflexivity, they're the same. Um, and so AGDA considers terms that uh, evaluate to the same thing to be identical. Um, but other things need to be uh, need to be proved manually. So one one thing that's manual is the congruence proof. So if you know that f is a function from a to b and a is equal to a prime, then we know that f of a is equal to f of a prime. So equal arguments applied to the same function are going to be equal. Um, and the proof of that is well going to come by pattern matching on this equality proof which will tell you these are exactly the same, and then we can appeal to reflexivity. But if we want to prove that n plus 0 is equal to n, well, this equation, n plus 0, it does not it happen automatically. So there is no reduction rule for that. We have 0 plus m goes to m, but not m plus m, um, not m plus 0 goes to e, uh, m. And so we have to prove this sort of by uh, recursion on the natural number, and then we appeal to uh, to induction or recursion. So we can we have to prove this by induction or recursion on on this data type here. So we'll say that zero in the case where n is equal to zero, we have to prove that zero plus zero is equal to zero, and that that you can get by re by evaluation, and in the uh, case where it's a successor of something, then we have to uh, um, we have to make a recursive call. We will learn that uh, uh, by we, we know that n is equal to this successor. And so a recursive call on this smaller n will tell us that smaller n plus 0 is equal to 0. And then congruence with successor will tell us that successor of n is going to be equal to uh, is going to be equal to the to the thing that we want. And so the inductive proofs become recursive functions. Okay, uh, so let me actually do this little proof here. And I'll try to Actually, I won't do this proof because I'm sort of uh, running long on this uh, on this uh, lecture. Um, um, I'm, I might put up a bonus lecture where I do some uh, some proving in Agda, so you can see how this goes. Um, so, so when you do when you prove when you do mathematics uh, on pencil and pencil paper, you need a bunch of properties of equality that it's. Uh, Asymmetric and transitive and reflexive, so it's an equivalence relation. And you also need to know that uh, equality is a congruence, so that if you have, uh, if you have uh, 
uh, a term with two equal with two equal subterms in it, uh, you can you can uh, you can fill in the holes with equal things and get equal things. And so symmetry says if A is equal to B implies B is equal to A. Transitivity tells us that if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. And congruence, which we've just seen, is that if we have a function f and A is equal to A prime, then f of A will be equal to f of A prime. And so equality is uh, you know, a reflexive, it's an equivalence relation which is congruent with everything. Um, and so then you can use these properties to do uh, more sophisticated proofs like the commutativity of addition. Um, but I think I will carry on with that in the next lecture. Okay, so dependent types um, let us refer to program terms in types. And this lets us write programs which state very precise properties of programs. And so equality is expressible as a type. And so writing programs becomes the same as proving it correct. And when you do this, I have to admit, it is really hard. It's like you've, you've, you may know mathematics well and you know programming well. And then when you learn dependent type theory, it's like you're, you're a beginner once more. So everything, everything is difficult once again. Um, but it's super fun because learning to program was fun, learning to do mathematics was fun, and dependent types is a rare is a rare chance to sort of enter that beginner spirit again. And once you do, you can write programs that are absolutely guaranteed to be correct. Um, okay, so that so thank you very much.